Well, welcome to Life Group Video Equipping. You're watching this uh, either as a Life Group Guide or maybe a future Life Group Guide. And I want to thank you for your investment into the lives of people. I really hope this is beneficial and helpful for you today. And what we're doing is we're taking a look at each of our four questions that our life groups are built around. And we kind of look at these four questions as anchors. Uh, a boat needs an anchor. And the reason it needs an anchor is to keep it from drifting. And our life groups are built around four questions that really help us in the pursuit of overall health and consistency and to keep from drifting uh, in our life groups. And today we're going to look at this question. How are you fulfilling the Great Commission? How are you fulfilling the Great Commission? Now what an incredibly important question to continually ask uh, ourselves uh, and in our life groups. Now the aim of this question is pretty simple. It's faithful gospel witness. That as a part of this life group community, over time, as this question is continually asked, that the fruit of that will be, over time, faithful gospel witnesses. That we are faithfully declaring the good news of the gospel that Jesus saves. God saves sinners through Jesus Christ. And we want to continue to grow as faithful witnesses. Now, the background and really the the premise behind all of this is the Great Commission itself given by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. We know this, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, there at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus says, uh, Jesus came up and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit teaching, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and behold, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So what's behind this question is right there out of Matthew chapter 28, what we call the Great Commission. Now, even though we see it really clearly in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, it's a thread that's pulled throughout Scripture. Throughout the Bible is this command, this commissioning that every follower of Jesus Every God follower is given to be a faithful witness. Uh, we see this in Psalm 96, verse 2, and the Bible says, Sing to the Lord, bless his name, tell of his salvation from day to day. Right there in Psalm 96, we see that the overflow of worship is going to be faithful witness. Isaiah chapter 12, verse 4 says it this way, And you will say in that day, Give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Proclaim that his name is exalted. Right there again, that same thing, that God's salvation to the peoples flows through the faithful witness of his people. As we continue to grow as faithful witnesses of this message of the gospel. Acts 1.8 Jesus again to his disciples says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my, there it is, witnesses. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Over and over you hear this theme throughout scripture that we as people are called to be his witnesses, to make known the message of the gospel. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse 20. The Apostle Paul writes it this way, Therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ. Do you hear that? We are. That's who we are. It's the identity of every follower of the Lord Jesus Christ is a faithful witness. Here Paul uses the idea as of an ambassador. We are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. It's an incredible language here. We, Paul says, implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. The word ambassador here literally means we represent. We are God's representatives. We are speaking to this world, to this lost world, on his behalf, making known the message of the gospel. So this question in your life group is to be a tool used week upon week, over and over, consistently, and it's to be a tool to continue to teach, 
to continue to call us to action, to call us to obedience, to remind us of the truths of who we are, who God has commissioned, who God has called us to be. So as you use this tool of this question uh, in your life group, there are a couple really important implications. So how are you fulfilling the Great Commission? Implication number one is this. Uh, The command and pursuit of making disciples is given and defined by Jesus. Jesus gives this commissioning, and Jesus also defines it for us. He says, all authority has been given to me. Jesus is speaking as one with complete authority. This is not a suggestion. This is not something that we hope to get around to someday. This is who we are as his people. We are called to be working about building our lives around the fulfillment of the Great Commission. He calls us to this activity. He says, go therefore, making disciples, baptizing them. Baptism is the public testimony that one has responded to the gospel. What does that mean? The idea there for us is that we are sharing the message of the gospel and we're calling for a response. We're making disciples. We're baptizing. Verse 20, he says, we're to be teaching. That's the ongoing discipleship so that disciples become disciple makers. Jesus defines the activity of fulfilling the Great Commission for us. It's an issue of obedience, as we see here. The Great Commission is given to every single believer. There are no exceptions. Jesus gives this to every single believer in every generation for all time. We are called, commissioned, and equipped to be fulfilling the Great Commission. So this question in your life group is not just for some. It's for every single believer in your life group to be asking this question of themselves and as a group continually, how are you fulfilling the Great Commission? And then at the end of this, Jesus promises his presence. We don't do this alone. He says, and I am with you always. So as we carry out this command of fulfilling the Great Commission, Jesus promises his presence. Also, as we do this as a life group, we do this together in community. So in your community, as we ask this question consistently over time, uh, in this community, we're to be spurred on, we're to be challenged, we're to be convicted and growing in how we are fulfilling the Great Commission. Second implication in this is really important is this. Making disciples isn't something we add to our busy lives. Making disciples should define our lives. And I think this is really important, even in the language here of Matthew 28, as we continually ask this question in our life group, Jesus is not saying, okay, when you get around to it or uh, add this to your life, see if you can make time to share the gospel. See if you can make time to make the disciples. Now, Jesus says, go. And the idea of go here is literally, it, it, be, it could be translated as you are going. And in your life group, it's really important to be reminded this is not something we tack on to our lives. We build our lives around this. Before someone in your life group is a businessman, if if they're a Christian, before they're that, they're an ambassador for Christ. Before someone is a public school teacher, for example, they've been commissioned to be a witness. Before someone is a college student and they're a believer, they, they are on mission to make Jesus known. Here at Tri-Cities, we have something called Go Moments, and Go Moments are this exact idea. It's not, fulfilling the Great Commission is not something we tack on. As we go, we are seizing everyday opportunities to make Jesus known, to be faithful witnesses wherever God plants us in our daily life. I think that's a really important point for your life group. So there are implications with this question as you continually use this tool repeatedly, consistently over time in your life group. Now, let's change gears a little bit and talk about, okay, what what does that discussion look like? Let's talk about that discussion. I'll give you some handles that I think may help you going into your life group, during your life group, and then even coming out of your life group around this uh, question of how are you fulfilling the Great Commission? Uh, Number one, uh, pray. Can't stress that enough of the importance of praying before your life group, praying during and with your life group, praying after your life group. 
it, it should be as we're fulfilling the Great Commission, and we even ask this question as a group, we're praying, not just talking about lost people, we're praying for lost people by name. Uh, we're praying as a group that God would give us a burden for the lost around us. We're praying particularly for names. We're using our three names card that we do here as a church, and we're regularly praying for those three names of lost people in our lives as a life group. Uh, we're praying scripture as a life group. A great way to go about this is maybe take a passage like Matthew chapter 9, verses 37 and 38, where Jesus said, Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And then Jesus says, Therefore pray. He says, Pray this. Pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest that he would send out laborers into his harvest field. You begin to pray that over one another and for one another, and we become the answer to our own prayer as we're sent out with the message of the gospel. So pray. Secondly, read. I encourage you to regularly read passages of Scripture that call to mind and remind us that we're called and commissioned to fulfill the Great Commission. For example, I shared some passages with you earlier in this equipping video that maybe you could use. Let me give you another one. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Peter says this, But you are a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation, speaking to God's people. A people for his own possession. Why? That you may proclaim, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We are these things, and we are called to make him known, to proclaim. So read the scriptures that call us to this with and over your life group. Let the word of God shape our hearts and our perspectives and even our activity around the Great Commission. Thirdly, I encourage you to ask Ask engaging questions. Don't just stop with, uh, how are you fulfilling the Great Commission? And it just kind of stops there. And continue. A ask more questions. Uh, who are you burdened for? Who is in your life that does not know the Lord Jesus? When is the last time you shared the gospel? Ask that question in your life group. Continue to press on with probing questions. What keeps us from being faithful witnesses or what hinders us from making disciples and fulfilling the Great Commission? Ask and listen and talk through some of these probing questions in your life group. Next, I would say share. As a leader, lead by example. Be willing to share in your own life. You, you model this pursuit. You be the first one to share the last time you attempted to share the gospel. Share your victories. Share your misses or your losses. Share the pursuit. And I would even say what would be incredibly encouraging is share your own repentance. I think there's times that we read the Great Commission. If we were real honest, our response to the Great Commission in Matthew 28 needs to be repentance. Lord, this is what you are calling me to. And Lord, I have failed. I haven't pursued it like I want to or like you're calling me to. Own that. Share that. You lead out in that in your life group. Next, I think it would be important to plan. Uh, your GO team here has prepared opportunities for you as a life group, batting cages, where you as a life group can go and engage in our community and experience opportunities to share the gospel. We have something called Serve and Share. You can find that on the website, and you as a life group guide can plan opportunities for your group to go together and be challenged in situations to share the gospel, learn from each other, model it in front of each other. Serve and share. Encourage you to check that out and have a plan. And then finally, I would just say assist. Be willing to resource, equip, and help those in your group that need to grow in this area and want to grow in this area as this question is asked. Be willing to come alongside specific members of your group who struggle in this pursuit. Direct them to resources that are on our website, on our Go page. Uh, offer to go with them. Offer to pray with them. Invite a member of the Go team who would be willing to come to your life group and provide some equipping uh, for you and your group as you continue this pursuit. That's what this question is. It keeps this pursuit of the Great Commission in front of us and in front of our life group. Every believer, we're commanded, equipped, empowered by the Spirit of God to fulfill the Great Commission. And as a group, you get to pursue that together. Paul and... Who else is coming up? Wesley?
you guys come on up. So we're going to move to a panel discussion, hopefully be helpful to you, and then I think you're going to break into your uh, time. So you want on stage or down? That's fine. Yeah, this is fine. Um, so thanks again for being here today and taking the time out. Uh, you know, this is something that's really important every month that we do, and uh, Wes has talked about a lot, but these, these guide trainings, they're, they're a part of the responsibility of being a life group guide. So thank you for being here. If there's ever a week uh, you can't be here, just as a reminder, um, we want you to engage in the content. So we're recording all of this. It's online, the same questions, interactions, your coaches are going to be talking to you. So if there's ever a week you're not here, make sure you're continuing to interact because we want to help you help your group follow Jesus. Like, that's the goal. That's the heart. It's not just another program we're doing. We want to help you make disciples through your life group. And you've given us a lot of practical uh, ideas for how to do that. But we just want to take it even a notch down and just say, uh, address just some other practical things that we hope will help you as you lead through conversations. But before we talk some more about best practices, kind of like we did last time, let's, let's talk a little bit about blunders or blind spots. So, We've all been in a group where you've tried to have the conversation and maybe it hasn't gone well. You've already alluded to that. So uh, I'd love for us just to be able to talk a minute about how has that happened for us <laughs> and our learnings in that. So Wes, I'll let you start, man. Why don't you jump in? Yeah, so uh, this is a, um, <clears throat> a tendency and something to look out for, I think, just generally speaking in small group leadership. But it's especially dangerous or uh, it's especially tempting when we're talking about our gospel witness and the Great Commission, is I agree, it's, it's good to allow some tension in the room. But at, at this, and, and what I've, though, found I've done sometimes is made it a one-on-one -on -one conversation between me as the guide and the one person in the group who is actively thriving and growing and contributing something to the conversation because they're doing it. And I've turned it into just Rhonda and I talking about what she's doing one major blunder, I think, is, is that, and it's dangerous in this area because I'm assuming, without saying it, it's okay that everyone else doesn't contribute to the conversation, right? I want to hold Rhonda up as an example and let her talk about it, and we want to champion that and pray for that, but how do I, without saying, see, the rest of you guys should be like Rhonda, right? None of us want to do that, right? So one blunder, I think, is not figuring out a way to bring the rest of the group into the conversation uh, in this area because we're, we're accidentally implying, it's all right, Rhonda's got that for our group, we are good, right? This is a personal, specific command to each believer. So some common ways I think you can do that is, you know, Rhonda comes back, I shared the gospel with such and such last week, and they said this, and I didn't really know how to respond. Okay, guys, how can we help encourage Rhonda from the scriptures? How can... You know, that's an easy way now. Did, they, did that make them share the gospel in that moment? No, but it helped them think through and rehearse and put themselves in that position a little bit. It's a step for them. It's different in a group sharing with people that are believers, but it's, a, it's even a little bit of practice for them too. So figure out a way. Don't, don't make it because probably your nine people aren't all at the same level in this area. Uh, blunders, right? Yeah. So... <laughs> One, in his moment of confession, is lack of consistency with this question. And here's why. Because I know it's been maybe a week or two since I've shared the gospel, maybe a month. I don't want to bring that question up. Somebody's going to ask me. And then the other one is I know I'm not sure anybody in the group has shared the gospel or anybody's going to have anything to say. So here's what I do. I avoid it, and we never grow. That, that's been a huge blunder of mine. So let's be real honest. There are certain of the questions we like to ask more than the other ones. That's not the point. The, the way we're, these are anchors that we want to be consistent over time. So one of mine I just, has been great inconsistency. The other one's just been ridiculous assumptions. <laughs> so everybody's not at the same place. So to say, how are you fulfilling the Great Commission, and assume everyone is even communicating that at the same level, to some it means, well, I, I, you know, I patted somebody on the back and said, God bless you. I mean, literally, I've, I've had that. And I didn't take enough time to even continue to explain and teach and have input from the group what we're talking about. So make wrong assumptions about what we mean by faithful gospel witness. Those are teaching opportunities. We have two former Catholics in our group 
right now. When we started talking about this, they first came to our group. They were on a different planet of what that talk, what that meant. Time, consistency has changed that significantly. There's still a lot of room to grow, but those are a couple of just silly mistakes. No, that's great. I, you know, when I think about it, what you just said is definitely one of mine. Uh, celebrating the wrong things, if we're not careful. So, you know, sometimes the person in our group might go do some sort of act of service, you know, might go serve somewhere, but they didn't share, you know. And so it's easy to celebrate, oh, you went to the, and distributed food boxes this weekend, but did we actually talk about Jesus, you know? Or, you know, you had a conversation with one of your free names, but did we actually talk about the gospel? And sometimes it's easy to kind of celebrate, well, you took a step of initiative, which uh, you can recognize that, but, but then having that conversation of, well, did we actually share? Did we actually talk about the gospel? Did we engage them on a spiritual level, or did we back off in fear and having that conversation? Um, and I think another one that you just said is important. Maybe for some of our groups, it's even starting with the conversation of what is the Great Commission. You know, maybe we kind of assume the Great Commission because our church talks about go a lot and we preach on those things, but even understanding of what it is and then what does it require of us could be a great thing to do. Um, another blunder for me that you mentioned earlier is the prayer piece. We take down names a lot, but often we run out of time to actually pray for those names. So are we actually taking time in our group to intercede on behalf of these people? They're not just names. They're actual people who don't know Jesus, who are headed to eternity separated from him. Are we taking the space to pray, to intercede on their behalf? Um, then a the last one, kind of what you're saying too, Wes, is sometimes for me, evangelism becomes the end instead of a means to an end. And Paul was talking about that today too. So I, I've had that pressure, same pressure. It's like, oh, life group's coming, and I'm going to have to answer that question. I need to go share with somebody something really quick so I have something to share in life group. Well, in that moment, I'm making evangelism the end, not worship. You know, like the quote that he said today, that, that uh, missions exist because worship doesn't. Do I, do I long to see people that come into right worship of God, or am I just trying to check off the box so when I get into that church conversation, I can say I did something, uh, and I make an idol out of it? So let's, let's talk some about best practices. You gave us six incredible, just simple things to do. Wes, anything that you would add to that list? Yeah, one really good practice, I think, is to practice in the group. I've heard several of you say uh, at times that you – and this is good for just coaching and gets you to know your group. And, again, you can figure out how to do this really well. But, man, you ought to know, I think, every person in your group, their understanding of the gospel. So one way you can do that is practice articulating that in front of them and let them practice it together. Maybe you've split up one night in groups of two or three and we're, we're dialoguing and practicing articulating the gospel. Or do that with your testimony. So I know some of you have done that, and it's been really good. It's a let's get to know each other, but then they're rehearsing, telling how their life was like before Christ and when the, how they came to Christ and now what their pursuit of him is like now. So theoretically, this ought to be the most comfortable space with, in which they sit during the week in, in our local body for the most part, right? So give them time to practice it. Most people have never practiced, I don't think, until they sign up for a short-term mission trip. And then their leader says, okay, we're going to practice this. And they go, what? Right? And so that, that ought not be the case culturally for us in our church. So it, if it can't start with your four, six, or eight people, that's not, that's not good news. So give them time to practice in the group, split them up, whatever. It would be some, I think, good advice on that. That's good. You mentioned something. So we did this during COVID yeah. on Zoom. Maybe some of you guys do this, but we did encourage every meeting, someone from the group, to share their testimony. Now, they knew it ahead of time, and it was a little bit of the new folks, that, all that. But also be ready on the back end of that to speak into that as a group and say, man, that's great, but could someone come to Christ by hearing your testimony? Is there enough gospel clarity of faith and repentance and the cross and resurrection from your testimony that you would be able to use that as a tool? And just make that a dialogue that the group, so you're accomplishing a couple things, getting to know each other, but you're also saying you, you have a testimony, but weave the gospel in it so that it could be used. So that was a practice that was really helpful. Yeah. 
I mentioned that text thread thing. It's just a little thing. However, the groups communicate through my hub or whatever it may be. But a way, for me, that's a little smaller piece of the larger goal that evangelism and the Great Commission is a community project. You, you're, you really, we say it, but you really are in it together. So someone is getting ready to go to a share meal or they're about to have something they even know what's going to happen. They know a friend, whatever. They can text the rest of the group and say, hey, this, ha- this happens. About ready to have a share meal. About ready to have a gospel conversation. Pray for me. And you get a few, I'm praying for you, praying for you. And really hope they are praying for you. But that's this sense that evangelism really is a group effort. It's not just this personal thing that we do. Yes, it's personal evangelism. But it's a community th- project. It's done together. Whatever you can do to create that sense of, of it happening together, I think your whole group benefits from that. Uh, so there's different ways to do it. That's one of the ways we do it. Yeah, and I think to that point, too, and this isn't, doesn't necessarily work for every life group, but where you can facilitate it's good is if your life group can be in a similar pocket or place of people who don't know Jesus and you're consistently showing up there together, and that was one of the main witnesses of the early church was that these Christians who lived life together all did and lived a different kind of way. And so it wasn't just saying Mike is different and he's weird, but this group of people are collectively pursuing this, this Jesus. And so if you can figure out ways to use those batting cage experiences as a group, it helps do that. Can I add to that for a second? Were you getting ready to say something? Okay, I'm the rugged pastor. You better watch it. Um, so... We've done this a few times, and Dave McCauley's sitting back there. We used to be in a life group together, and I, I, I'm going to use him as an example. He didn't know I'm going to, but so one of my three names is my neighbor. His name's Mike. Uh, anyway, it's not the point, but we'll have meals or fellowships as a life group. We may be meeting in our house, and multiple times I've asked Mike and Sherry to come to our house. They've come before. Why? Well, I want them to meet other believers, for one. So a real win in that, it's, it's burned in my mind. We've been sharing the gospel with this couple for years since we've lived there. Was when I saw, looked over Dave McCauley at Mike Canfield. We just met and are having a conversation, hanging out. I'm thinking, okay, his understanding of who Jesus is. and Just meeting other Christians helps. So think about that. I don't know what the rhythm of that is or even should be, but share meals can happen individually. Yes, I hope they're happening this week. Think how they can happen as a group. And our group's going to have a fellowship. Everybody invite one member of your na- three name. Maybe awkward. Man, you can figure out how that works. Somebody in the group shares their three to five minute testimony as a part of that meeting. And they hear a gospel testimony. But that individual or those individuals are meeting and around the body of Christ. And God uses that to bring people to Christ so often. That's a tool. Yeah, so I, was, I mentioned this last month in our conversation around best practices and pursuing conversation around God's word, and it applies here too. We talked about, somebody talked about taking a list down in the meeting, being sure you pray for them right then. A really good practice is to ask the next week, did you get an opportunity to share? Because then whatever their open-ended answer is, whether it's an excuse or a really good reason, or I did, you get to hear from a blank, a blank slate, their theology of how a person comes to Christ, what they think their role in that was, whether they thought, well, no, I didn't get to know them well enough yet. So the, just the question, how did this go? And then just be quiet. You're learning a whole lot about where that person is in a lot of different ways. Great Commission thinking and living exposes theological convictions in a way that maybe some other areas don't. And so you get a chance to learn and listen about where they are spiritually in other formative ways. Yes, not just as an end, like, like Paul was talking about. Yes, we do want to see that person come to Christ. But it's a way you get to listen and learn to what they value or what their affirmations are and what they might, how they might think, no, I, I try, I was getting ready to, but then I decided I didn't know them well enough yet. Or, and then you got to seize those opportunities to, to correct and teach or affirm. So you got to come back to it the next week and the next week. That's so good. And even to what you were saying, Mike, about inviting people who may not know Jesus into some of those settings where you might be having a fellowship with your life group, I think the converse also is true. I think a lot of times we 
have more boldness in our witness when we bring other believers into that with us. So, you know, so you might have somebody in your group who their three names is their kid's t-ball team and the parents around it. Well, maybe them bringing some other life group members to those games, be around those people or to those celebrations, bring other people in with you. It doesn't just have to be this person sharing the gospel over here or that person there that should be happening, but, but do it together. Uh, I think another great practice is to have a, a conversation. This might be one of those that's going to take most of your life group time. Uh, but ask them about their, their great commission or their discipleship, discipleship, disciple-making plan. Like, Do they have a plan? So, And you might even just have to talk through, okay, what does your normal weekly rhythm look like? Who are people in that weekly rhythm who don't know Jesus? What are some ways on a normal basis you could have gospel opportunity there. What does that look like for a month? What does that look like during the year? So the year might be, can you go on a mission trip this year? Can you take your family on a mission trip this year? Can, can you think about these different rhythms? And even think about, okay, the course of a year, where is everyone in our group going to be? And let the group help each other. Let them talk about that together and, and come up with a strategy. Uh, a lot of times when we don't plan, we're planning to fail, as the old adage goes. Uh, and then the last one I would give is um, part of the Great Commission is teaching them to observe or obey all that I've commanded you. There's a lot in that all. So even just if, if people in your group will get in the rhythm of just discipling someone, even if it's a young believer, it will help you share the gospel more. If you're helping someone follow Jesus in every single area, so you can ask Jason Allen there in my life group, uh, I ask a lot, who are you discipling? Like, who's one per at least one person in your life who are you regularly meeting with and helping them walk through Scripture and walk in obedience to Scripture? Well, if we start doing that, you start developing that rhythm of being in the Word and bringing someone else to the Word, evangelism becomes a lot more regular, a part of our disciple-making. Uh, so teaching to observe and obey all the Word, which also means we've got to be in the Word, Right? Like if we're not in the Word, studying and growing and loving it, we're not going to be able to share it to others. So anything else you guys would add before we send it to our groups? Yeah, just real quick, you mentioned, again, there's a lot of opportunities here for you as a group. Uh, Go Team is trying to build opportunities that you could go on a mission trip as a life group. Pastor Gene's modeling that, not his entire life group, but part of his life group is going to be going to Clarkston in June, Clarkston, Georgia, where we work as a church. Four-hour drive, maybe a couple nights in a hotel. But your whole group could experience that together, again, raising that water level in your group. And I think it's important that this question reminds us, and we keep it in front of us, individuals, life groups, churches, families become inward-focused naturally. You just need to know that about your group. It, it, left alone, you're going to become inward-focused. This question forces you to continually be looking outside of your group. That's why it has to be regularly a part of what we're doing. Naturally, it becomes about us. And we've got to fight against that. That's great. So I'm going to turn it to Wes in just a second, who will give us direction for the last half an hour or more of our time. Uh, before we do, I just, I just want to bring us back around to something that Wes said at the very beginning. So he talked about how over the next month, month and a half, there's going to be some programming shifts, some worship gathering, time changes, those kind of things. Again, we'll be communicating those out, so you'll, you'll catch all that. Here are a few important things uh, I think for you guys to know because you are leaders of your groups uh, and, and your influencers there. One is know that this is a push, and you said it this morning, to move back to a new normal. And we really want to begin doing that in the life of our church for the next couple of months. So I hope that's encouraging you. I hope that's encouraging for your life group as you're having those conversations. Second, uh, there is a lot of rebuilding that's going to have to take place over the next few months. So be patient with our church as we move back to those new normals. Uh, kids ministry, student ministry, there's, there's a lot of rebuilding teams, rebuilding structures. So it's just not going to be flip a switch and everything was back the way it was in, in February of 2020. So as you're having conversations with people in your group and you, kids ministry things, student ministry, adult study groups are coming back, but they may not look exactly the way they did before, just help your group understand why and encourage a group to step up and be involved and even helping serve in the life of our church because it's going to take some time to transition those things back. Uh, and then the last thing that's really important, as we begin to bring study groups back on Sunday mornings, kids groups, student groups, all that kind of stuff, we prioritize the gathering, the coming together and worship. 
above all those other programs. Because again, those programs, they're good, they're helpful, they, they facilitate discipleship, but they're not biblical mandates, they're not biblical commands. Gathering together physically with God's people is. And so as we come back to that, there's going to be that temptation, uh, even for families, so I'll speak to those of you who have families with young kids in your group, uh, for them to want to come to worship one hour and send their kids to group that same hour. Don't let them do that. <laughs> let them be in the gathering. The gathering is a gift of grace. We want the whole family get to be there. And so if, if families can only come one hour as we begin moving back to these things, encourage them to be in worship together. That, that's a healthy rhythm that we're going to begin to adopt and help families to adopt because a lot of people have been used to not having that. And so coming back in is going to be some new normal. So those aren't new things, but just things as you're coming in, you're going to get more conversations within your groups about what are we doing, what does this look like, all that kind of stuff. If you have questions, reach out to Wes, reach out to our elders, we'll help you. But I would just want to put those things on your radar as you think through what the next couple months look like.